Welcome to Life Without Labels. I want to talk to you about something. I want to talk about the brain, or rather, if the brain was a landlord, I want to talk to you about its tenant, the mind. The human brain, or mind, is extremely complicated. It's complex. It's been shaped by three billion years of nature. That means evolution. And for most of that time, its main function has really been just to stay alive, keep on reduce, reproducing, play by the rules of evolution, get on to the next, next one. But as we each time we evolve, we grow, we get better and better. Mutations change us. But that doesn't stop the fact that for three billion years, every living thing on this planet has been rooted in the natural world, including our ancestors of human beings. But then, about 200,000 years ago, something very, very strange happened. We don't know what exactly. A mutation, probably, in the brain. But what it led to was a significant change in the way that the human brain works. What it did was cause a drastic change to the way that human beings lived. And since that time, it's taken us into a world quite unlike the world in which we originally spawned and nurtured. And if we're not careful about that, and if we do not understand this reason behind this more clearly and spread that information, then human beings are going to... No, sorry, nothing wrong with your bandwidth. I just wanted to explain that your brain is an anomaly detector. You're expecting a story, beginning, middle, and it's going to... Well, blah. The truth of the matter, of course, is that the brain needs patterns. It needs certainty, what some philosophers call closure. And when we don't get closure, we have an anomaly. And the brain, the old part of the brain that's been with us and doing us very, very well for billions of years, is going to detect that anomaly and divert resources, mental resources, towards it. It's going to switch off what else you're doing and notice that, either a minor level or a major level. And then when it's safe, go back to doing what you're doing. So in a way then, the brain is a life-saving anomaly detector. It's a kind of a fight and flight without necessarily having to fight or flight. At the lowest level, it's just a way of letting you know that something's happening. And also, another function to the brain, it's social. Ever since the beginning of time, even bacteria talk to each other, and human beings most definitely do. Now, to understand the brain better, first of all, I want to have a few words with you about the way we think about things, and brains in particular. You see, the sense we make of the brain can only be understood in terms of things already available to us. We cannot talk about a concept if we haven't really got some idea of the concept in mind. We can't just use a new language because, well, the person you're speaking to wouldn't understand. Remember, the social creatures, we have to connect. For thousands of years, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of years perhaps, the, the brain was understood as God or spirit. We can infer this, well, we can't prove it, of course, from some of the bodies that were found in Neolithic grave sites, where these people appear to have had holes drilled in the front of their head. Why? These are clean holes to let the spirit out, to let the devil out. We don't know, but the idea that somehow God and spirit and brain and the mind are all closely tied together, that consciousness, is soul, is a gift from God, are very, very strongly held within us. It's only really in the last 500 years that the very strict grip that God and spiritualism of some sort or another has finally released its grip on our understanding of the brain. And that has opened a door to scientific inquiry, rational scientific inquiry. We'll hear more about rational scientific inquiry in a bit. But what I want to do now is work, not work back a bit. How do we get to this situation in the first place? I want to go back to what life might have been like, or rather what a brain or a mind might have been like three billion years ago when life began. And back then, remember, you and I looked pretty much like, well, a bit like this. Let's take this monocellular organism, the amoeba. It's a pretty good stand-in for the kind of creatures that were swimming around in the sea. Remember, we were born and grew up in the sea as a human race many, many zillions of years ago when we looked like this. Notice how this creature has got a body. Okay, the body's somewhat wobbly. It's a thin membrane made of protein and, and fat and, and lipids and things. But it's a body. Outside the body is the gods making uncertainty. You might say the mind-blowing uncertainty of the world, the universe. Inside is warm, it's stable. What we call housekeeping genes are keeping the processes inside the body 
running over smoothly. The metabolism is keeping it warm, keeping it alive and active. Now, those genes, believe it or not, the housekeeping genes are exactly the same in you and me and an amoeba in a potato. We haven't really changed. Nature is fond of a good trick. If something works, why not use it for the next few billion years? This amoeba is moving, interestingly, towards a food particle, the yummy in the blue, and away, you might see, from the dangerous toxin particle, dodgy red over there. There's a line, there's the, there are one or two points called receptors on the surface of that membrane, and we know this because all cells have them, that can actually detect something out there in the world. In other words, this living thing has sensation. And it can take that information and somehow change the substrate inside the cell, the contents of the cell, to store it. And somehow convey that storage back out again in the form of action. Interesting enough, those transmitters can also send out signals when the thing is under threat. It can say, help me, or I would like to mate with you. Even amoebas are basically social creatures. What we have here is basically the fundamentals of the mind, a memory, intent, action, response, and storage. All these things come together. Now, it was pretty soon that most chemical messengers from one cell to another made amoebae clump together. They realized that maybe two or three cells or maybe live on an economy of scale and do a much better job of staying alive. Because as I say, staying alive and communicating is what it's all about. So let's just fast forward now to maybe half a billion years later. Let's look at this little organism. I won't stay with you for too long, but let's just see that this is the sort of creature that I've been crawling around about half a billion years ago. Notice how the sense organs are now more sophisticated. There's a clearly key, an eye and a nostril here. And notice how the sense organs are slap bang close to what is now a much larger brain. And notice how that brain is connected via a long wire to every other bit of the body. And every other bit of the body is pointing back up and talking back to the brain. There is a loop here. Body talking to brain, brain telling body to move, move shifts the eye, the eye sees something different, it feeds it back to the brain. Up a bit please, lift a bit please. It's an amazing fluid organism. Let's now fast forward 200,000 years ago to this gorgeous looking guy. There you go, Homo erectus. He's probably about 500, maybe so 5,000 human generations. If we take a generation as about uh, 40 years, this guy's your great great insert uh, uh, um, 500 there. He's your great, great 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 500 grandfather. It's that close. Look at the guy. What has he got? He's now got his sense organs at the front of the face. Notice the eyes are looking forward. That's good 3D vision. Notice that it's on top of about a fibre. In this case, this, this, this hunk's case, a six foot high tower. So he can be above. He's upright. He walks. Well, in this case, he crouches. And look at his right hand. He's holding, or should I say, grasping something. This creature is heading places. Something has happened to this creature that has changed him out of all recognition to his squidgy predecessors. What might that be? When you look inside his head, you'll see something really quite spectacular. Let's compare his head, say, inside, with that of the possum or the rabbit, animals that pretty much, if we look at skeletal forms and fossil forms, haven't changed that much. Look what has happened to the size of the human brain. It's had a kind of a cortical makeover. Look at it, a dirty great big cortex sitting like a, a cerebral mushroom on top of the stalk that you can just about see poking out from the bottom. That is basically a profound change. And virtually all of that mechanism is devoted to storage and communication. I want to show you a kind of technical diagram now that goes inside that brain. It's a schematic rather than an actual drawing of the real thing, but please bear with me. This is a diagram of brain, pretty much in a schematic form. And I want you, please pay attention to my cursor, to see that it comes up from the spinal cord. There is a torrent of information coming up from the body, for the vagus nerve and into the body. And it arrives at the primitive, the old, the ancient part of the brain that hasn't changed that much since you and I were squidgy worms. It's still working. Nature likes the trick. This information is then filtered and processed through incredibly ancient emotional parts of the old brain. What it does is it filters out things and it looks at all the other things that have gone before in the terms of experience that are stored. 
To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.